Treasurer Ray Rossett, board members John Herfel, Ron Fuller, Kyle Clem, Tom French, Minnie Lennox, and Clyde Covington. I must also take just a moment to recognize the fact that we, we lost one of our board members last week the great historian, Orville Albritton. Um, and so we take just a moment to think about Orville and what he contributed to the society. And then I'm going to ask our incoming board members to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is over there. <laughs> of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. See, that was problem solving. I always have to get somebody to volunteer to raise the flag. <laughs> took care of that today. So, with that said, um, I am now going to ask, we're not going to do thankfully for you, each one individually, but I'm going to ask each member, do you swear to uphold the Constitution and bylaws of the Garland County Historical Society and actively promote and represent the society in Garland County and assist us in achieving our mission? I do. Thank you. You are duly inaugurated. With that, I'm going to turn it over. who was John Conley. Others who served were David Whittington. I don't see Susan here today. That was her father, Susan and Mary's. Dr. Ronnie Bracken, Joe Poe. Do y'all remember some of these names? I'm sure you do. Pearl Ridgeway, Orville Albritton, Clyde Covington, Gary Jackson, and Julie Brenner Nix. Julie served during the difficult COVID years, and yet she achieved so much. We now have a membership renewal system and corporate sponsors, which are 
National Park Gifts and Souvenirs. I always get it mixed up. AT&T and Myers Realty. Julie co-chaired our popular Turf Homes Hidden Hot Springs. She's contributed several articles to the record over the years. And she was the guiding force behind our 2022 strategic plan. Julie, can you come up here, please? It's with gratitude and thanks from all of us to give you this certificate of appreciation for all that you've done at Julie. We have this really neat gift for you, and I, I hope you're going to enjoy it. Showing me. <laughs> no, it's really involved. It's really involved. So, sit down and figure it out. Because Liz and I tried to, and we couldn't. We think Julie. Didn't she, Julie take care of that. And now our tremendous executive director, Liz Rollins, will come up to introduce our speaker. Thank you so much. Thank y'all for being here today. Before we get to today's speaker, uh, I want to tell you next month on the third Tuesday, which is February 21st, we're going to have Ranger Kendra Barrett here as our guest speaker on the topic Hot Springs for Health, then and now. I love then and now things. Yeah. <laughs> and she's going to talk about the evolution of public health at Hot Springs from the late 19th century until today. And I think that will be a really nice compliment to what Kane is going to do today to fill in this picture for us. Now, Dr. Kane West is an academic historian currently working for Hot Springs National Park. Though a native son of Arkansas from Little Rock, actually he described himself as a city boy, uh, he spent the last decade in the National Park Service working all over the country at a variety of nature and history themed parks. Fortunately, his academic research on settlement in the Arkansas River Valley has always kept him tethered to his home state. He recently joined the staff of Hot Springs National Park as its education coordinator, finally joining his academic passion with his home state enthusiasm and we're so glad you're here in hot springs and you're here with us today dr kane west this is my first time to get to present sort of a public lecture for hot springs so when i get it wrong uh, i will feel um, nervous, but when I get it right, I will feel. If anybody's ever talked to Liz before, every time I talk to her, she says, oh, you should write that in the record. And I want to want y'all to know that we at the Park Service tremendously benefit from all the work that y'all do, the research that you've done, it contributes to our education program. So thank you all for uh, being such a really vibrant uh, County Historical Association uh, the Arkansas Historical Association, they always bring up Garland County as well. And so I'm going to wear two hats today, even though my main park ranger hat is to the side. And so I'm both a park ranger, right? So I work for Hot Springs National Park, but I'm also coming as a historian. And so sometimes you won't see the, the change, but I will feel it uh, for how I want to present this information and a little bit of the argumentation that I want to provide. So. Hot Springs, when we think about its founding as part of the National Park Service, we'll often mention uh, 1832, oldest unit in the National Park Service. We don't like to brag, but we're the oldest, we're the first. So we often will talk about that early period, but very often neglected not only by um, the general public, but by even National Park Service historians is Hot Springs' role in 1916 with the creation of the National Park Service as a sort of a government entity. And so that's where I want to begin to offer my um, initial research into that topic, right? So this is sort of an ongoing research that will be a, a work in progress, if you will. Right. So 
brief overview of our recorded history at Hot Springs National Park and Hot Springs. It really begins early 1800s for recorded written stories, though there are a handful of 1700s references to the Hot Springs area. And in 1832, this sort of uh, this geological wonder, right? It's the hottest water that had been measured scientifically to that point in North America, 143 degrees, 40 dozen or 40 some odd springs coming out of the hillside, a, an unexpected marvel west of the Mississippi River. And it was already being used as a medicinal destination for people, specifically in the Mississippi Valley, but across the country as well. <clears throat> And so Hot Springs is going to be set aside, reserved from public use in 1832. Um, the legislation for it, it can be found just in here. It is super light. It basically says that the Hot Springs and four surrounding sections will be reserved from public use, basically for private ownership for the future disposal of the federal government. It doesn't really tell us much. Uh, it's going to lead to tremendous uh, excitement in the United States Supreme Court over the following 40 years, uh, but that's our our beginning as a national park is this Hot Springs Reservation in 1832. The intention really being for public health and public use, but you don't see that written into the original legislation. Now, uh, when we talk about the historic national parks, you can see people are running, they're super excited to hear about this, so that's why we're hearing footsteps above us, is my guess. Uh, but they're wondering, what was the first national park? Well, let's answer. Um, I'm not saying that Hot Springs uh, is the first national park. I usually say we're the oldest unit in the National Park Service. But if you look for the blue dot next to Hot Springs Reservation, this was submitted to Congress in the 19 teens explaining the order of events in which national parks were established, and we're the first. So I'm not saying it. Congressional documentation said it. But we'll move forward into what it means to uh, be a national park. I will say that oftentimes you'll hear that Hot Springs is the first like uh, resource reserved by the federal government. I want to be a devil's advocate. There are forest reserves that were created uh, beginning in the 1790s but into the early 1800s. And these forest reserves were like live oak forests, and they were specifically to protect for naval use, right? So it's preserving a resource for specific industrial use or military use. This one is located in Florida. It's still part of a, a national scenic area. Um, so just a shout out that Hot Springs is the first of a, a the national park reservation, but not the first time that you're going to have the federal government trying to balance public use and uh, private ownership. That story of a uh, national park, the, the idea of a national park is going to see its next uh, iteration with this spot. Does anybody know where, I'm, where we're looking at right now? Yosemite, yes. Yosemite, Yosemite yeah. out west. Uh, 1864 is going to get set aside by Congress as a state park. And you're going to start to see the, the not only the legislation um, itself, but also some lingo from park developers, namely uh, Richard Ball Olmsted, that the national park should be, or that this park should be a public pleasuring ground. You sort of, sort of like walk into here and be like, ah, I am relaxed. I'm out of the city, life's good, for this, this playground and recreation idea to what a national park is. And that legislation, that language that we see uh, for scenery as a uh, sort of a, a recreational space is going to get, then get repeated at Yellowstone. And then who's been to this place? And this is actually, I presume this is actually your painting, and then we just pretend like it's Thomas Moran's painting. So this is from Thomas Moran, 1872, and what's happening is you're going to have a whole slew of developers and railroad developers and politicians who are going to try to set aside Yellowstone primarily for its scenery, uh, though animals are going to be added into the scenery, certain animals. They didn't want all animals, they just wanted the ones that people like to go paint pictures of. And so this is going to be this 
watershed moment, at least how we tell the national park story today, of a national pleasuring ground for the people, um, a place for specifically recreation. And you can actually see that uh, written into the language of the Yellowstone legislation is that parks, they're beautiful places, but they are for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. So there is always in these early park legislations the component of public use, right? So the people are supposed to go there, supposed to get out of the city, supposed to see the sights, you're supposed to be amazed, um, you're supposed to think. This is uh, a lot of park representatives are also saying in the post Civil War era, this is how you create a national identity is around the wild and sacred spaces. Right? So it is very much uh, the early park idea coming from public use of scenic places. Meantime, Hot Springs tootling along. Uh, if you follow anybody who's a fan of the Garland County Historical Society, you've probably seen this picture. It's a, it's a later postcard that is sort of uh, retroactive, I guess. But you're going to see Hot Springs is Hot Springs Bathhouse Row, where I work today, right over here. Um, we have, and this picture, it shouldn't actually be in here. Uh, the, Government free bathhouse, so a version of that was on that location. And then we have our hotels. So if anybody wants to stay at the waters, it's like version number five of a hotel there. And if anybody wants to come to uh, the Fordyce bathhouse, which plug for the Fordyce bathhouse, we are closed for the next six weeks, except for information. And we will have our first exhibit redo in 34 years. So it's gonna be exciting whenever we reopen Grand opening, yes, and but save all your, don't use all your claps now because we will want them also at the grand reopening. And so, but, so Hot Springs has a very different orientation than what we're going to be seeing at Yellowstone. Even though Yellowstone people are using the Hot Springs for medicinal purposes, uh, even at that same time. But what's going to develop following Yellowstone is a sort of a, a grab bag, a potpourri bag of new national parks. And between 1872 and 1916, there's going to be about a dozen national parks that are created. Uh, some of you might have been to some of these. Does anything look familiar to anybody? You can just yell it out if you think you see it. You have to yell over the hammers. <laughs> Mesa Verde, yes. Our first, well, our second part dedicated to uh, preserving archaeological sites. Redwood. Redwoods. And this is actually Sequoia, but it's, you know, same idea. So the Save the Redwoods, the Sequoias, um, those giant western trees, absolutely. Anything else we see that's familiar? Glacier, yes. Anybody who wants to be really cold can go hang out in Glacier and see the dozens of uh, Glaciers that were present at that time. The not the Teton. What, this one? No, this one. Oh, that's this is gonna be glacier. What else are we thinking? Uh, like Carl's Rock Cabin. This is gonna be Wind Cave. So we have Yellowstone, Sequoia. Well, then also called General Grant, Yosemite, Mount Rainier, Crater Lake, Wind Cave, Mesa Verde. Uh, Glacier, Rocky Mountain, also Platte National Park in Oklahoma, no longer a national park, uh, now a, a, but a park unit, and uh, Casa Grande Ruin, and Sully's Hill Park, and also Mackinac Island as a national park, right up here, no longer a national park. So you can tell that just sort of like, we're trying it, we're taking it back, we're trying it, we're taking it back. But there's not really a, uh, an organizing principle to these early national parks. We're going to have, scenic, it's all about scenic landscapes, but sometimes that sort of the grandiose landscape, sometimes it's a singular tree like General Grant, sometimes it's archaeological sites, sometimes it's mineral springs. So you have parks, but they're really dependent on like someone with influence saying, I want to preserve that. Right? So it, it's haphazard, there's not a consistent pattern that we see until 1906. 
and 1906 is going to be the passage of the Antiquities Act. And it's when we think about acts that define what parks should be, the Antiquities Act is really your first sort of institutional overview of what a park is. And the Antiquities Act is mainly coming out of a lot of concern for preserving archaeological sites. So I don't know if anybody in here really likes history. <laughs> Laughter, um, but this is you know in a, in a sense the, the Antiquities Act is for you, right? It's this idea that we need to preserve our, our not only our natural spaces but our cultural uh, spaces. And you're going to see, and the further aspect of the Antiquities Act is not only its motivation, but that it gives the president the right to reserve federal lands uh, by his by their own decree as much space as is needed or the smallest amount of space needed to preserve that feature. It's not always for archaeological sites, uh, though oftentimes it's going to be like Montezuma's Castle and uh, Canyon de Chez might be in there. And there's also a really cool park. It was dedicated to me on my trips. It's not true. That's going to be uh, Olympic National Park in Washington State. We have the Redwoods. We have, bless you, we have uh, Petri well, what does this one look like? We have Petrified Forest. Has anybody been here? First yeah. National yeah. Monument. Yep, yeah. Devil's Tower. And has anybody seen this place? Featured in the Griswold movies. The Grand Canyon. Yes, yeah, starts out as a National Monument. And one of my favorite uh, quotes being that man can do nothing but move. Paraphrase. Man can do, do nothing but mar this space. Keep it as it is, because we can only detract. And we know that there's at least one person who's very excited about the Antiquities Act. Teddy. Uh, he's going to, in his time, add five national parks to the, the seven that had existed prior, and 18 national monuments. So this is somebody who's adding a half dozen national parks, over nearly two dozen national monuments, Sort of that conservation ethos, this idea that the federal government has a responsibility to protect natural and cultural resources, and we have the legislative possibility to do that. So Antiquities Act has a tremendous influence on uh, early park preservation that we see today. And yet we see debates over what a park should be. And it mainly comes from the U.S. Forest Service. Do we have any Forest Service personnel in here? Thank you for all your work. Uh, when you think about the Forest Service, is it preserve it and don't touch it? Is it uh, preserve it for best use and wise management? Best use. So uh, the guiding principle being that we have these lands, it, it really comes out, out of concern that watersheds aren't going to be well preserved. And then uh, by the late 1890s, there's a, a need to have uh, forests that are actively managed by the federal government. Right? So we can, you know, we've seen this growing interest of federal protection, uh, a growing national uh, government. And it's the ultimate goal being uh, wise use, sustainable use, sustainable yield uh, based on the best available science. And Hot Springs is actually part of that for that Forest Service story. We're going to have the Washtenaw National Forest set aside in 1907. And so if, has anybody been up Highway 7? And there we go. So you're driving through one of the oldest uh, national forests in the country, right? So that beginning ethos, because in the early 1900s, Arkansas was the, the last, had the last virgin stands of major forest reserves in the country. How do you preserve that? And so we get that uh, scientific management. That's a very different vision uh, than uh, what other conservationists are looking for, right? This is about having park, having forest reserves and forest areas that have an ultimate sort of municipal outcome, a municipal goal, right? It's not what a lot of the conservationists uh, that we think of, like John Muir, are talking about. So you can see that there's a contest about, well, we preserve the land, but what do we do with it? And so we get to the 19 teens. We have a couple of dozen national monuments. We have a dozen national parks. We don't have a guiding principle. There's no unifying mandate outside of uh, the Antiquities Act, which is really just that the president can set aside federal lands. 
there is um, they're administered separately, right? You would get an appropriations bill for this park and then that park and then that monument. There are very few employees. By 1915, there are 90 employees in what would become the National Park Service. Uh, there's also really limited funds. This isn't the, the purpose and the goal of, uh, the, of Congress to that point, right? To, sort of set aside management spaces for people to go have a public playground. Uh, and there's also in the management itself, like well, what are we managing for? What is our outcome? Is it utilitarian? Are we trying to, uh, like the Forest Service, have an outcome? Or is it for aesthetic value? And so you'll see within the conservation movement this, this contrast or this tension between uh, the ultimate purpose of the preservation. And so, just like today was Coronation Day for our new uh, president, uh, we had in 1916, the Organic Act passed to try to define what a park is and to create a Federal Bureau of Parks. And we can read, and they wanted it to be sort of a Gibraltar moment, right? What is a park? How do we define it? What is its management purpose? And can we do this all in one singular bureau? And so if we read through the Organic Act legislation, uh, it sort of, it hints at a lot of the debates that have been going on, and it gives a sense of forward movement for future conservation. So it's going to conserve the scenery. So it's very much about scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife, right? So there's this protection aspect and it's naming what we protect. We protect scenery. We protect natural and historical objects. We protect wildlife. So it's uh, this is actually building off of what had been in the original Yellowstone legislation, that you want to keep uh, these natural spaces unimpaired. But there's a second component to the Organic Act, and it's a very pragmatic understanding of how to manage parks, a, a utilitarian outcome that isn't about sustainable yield. The utilitarian outcome is seen in the second line or the second underlying space. Leave it in such a manner that it is unimpaired for the enjoyment of, all, of present and future generations. So we're supposed to conserve it and you're supposed to go to it and hang out and play. So who here has gone to a national park and played and taken photos and seen the, yeah. So you have done part one, or part two. Uh, did you take photos while you were there? Did you take photos of like non-scenic places or did you take the good photos so you can show people? Well, yeah, we don't admit to the first part, but yes, you at least took one good photo. As long as you were in it, it's a good photo. Um, and so that's part one, right? So we have part one, part two. It's the scenic spaces, we're preserving them, but you are supposed to go to them, you are supposed to be there. And something that I always like to point out to myself and anybody who will listen is if you read the next section down and it names what parks will be entered into the National Park Service, that would be national parks, national monuments, and the only park named in this section with its full title, Hot Springs Reservation in the state of Arkansas. Take a bow at that moment. Woo -woo, yes, thank you. So we've been here for a while. Uh, we made a park, a national park in 1921, but we've been around for a while. But you can see in this legislation uh, that there is this idea of preserving scenery, it's the, but there's also the economic benefits of tourism and also the, um, the, the management of parks, right? So you have to, it's gotta be nice, but you gotta go and it's gotta be nice for the visitor when they get there, right? So there's this sort of tripartite purpose and you can really sort of, there are different ways to describe a national park because it's being trying to, it's being defined at that time. It's a, a scenic pleasuring ground. It's public use of scenic places, free of co commercial blight. And yet we can also see that there's always going to be this, how do we preserve things if we're going to use them, right? We got to preserve it, but use it. And there's always going to be management tension in which gets the highest priority. So that brings us to sort of the what I want to offer in my argument about, or just reveal 
about Hot Springs' role in the creation of the Organic Act. Uh, here we have the Fordyce, again, undergoing renovations as we speak. It's actually getting a deep clean as we speak, which is really nice. Thank you, Richard. Um, but in 1916, the Fordyce is a year old at that point. And it's sort of the question is, well, well, what role does Hot Springs play in this? Because we don't usually, people come all the time. They're like, I don't know why Hot Springs is a national park. And we have to sort of go back in time to understand that. Um, how does Hot Springs have a role? Well, we all know that Hot Springs is a big deal. It would be almost impossible to overstate how big of a deal Hot Springs is as a, uh, a health and leisure destination in the country. And it is not only do we have uh, our business bureau putting out great advertisements, but Hot Springs is sort of your first year round uh, destination. It's your first uh, all season resort. So before Disney is in Florida, Hot Springs is in Hot Springs. And so you can actually see that Hot Springs uh, in the winter, we are a uh, it, praise of Arkansas's winter health resort, let alone that we're nature's greatest sanatorium, at least according to the advertisers. And so you can also, and so with this idea of sanatorium, a place where you can go for health, for leisure, get out of the city, heal yourself from the hustle and bustle. Um, if you have tension or if you're nervous or you're frustrated by your job or you have uh, nerve issues or you're irritable, don't worry, you can go to Hot Springs. None of us are irritable. None of us have nerve issues. We're all living in the nature's greatest sanatorium. Uh, this is, and Hot Springs is developing at the same time that you're seeing these sort of leisure destinations across the country. We have racetracks in Saratoga. Cue the racetracks. If anybody's a fan of Larry Bird, he's the hick from French Lick, but French Lick is actually a mineral spring destination. I don't know why he, you know, gets this uh, perspective he does. He's, he's hanging out in the good stuff, right? We also have Warm Springs in Georgia that's going to be developed at this time, or different iterations of development of Warm Springs, and Coney Island, the only place you're allowed to buy a, a hot dog and call it a hot dog. Uh, so we can see that there's leisure travel around the country that's sort of emulating or, or parallel to Hot Springs National Park role, Hot Springs Reservation. And Hot Springs itself is this tremendous resort. If anybody is on the uh, if anybody's been through the archives and seen historic photographs, this was just circulating on the internet just a couple of days ago. Uh, but you can see that there's going to be these publications showing that Hot Springs is where you can go for drinking water fountains. You go for the medicinal baths. You go for the pleasuring park, the pleasuring grounds as you're walking around the four dozen hot springs. And you can stay at what was one of, if not the biggest hotel in the country. And at night, you can go hang out in the ballroom because they're going to have a full symphony bar or full symphony dance every night during the season. Right? Hot springs is this luxury resort, but also a mainstream resort. And it's also year round and you can get free water. And it's also being developed by the Department of the Interior. There are really impressive public works. So this is you know, the Department of the Interior overseeing parks starting in the 1880s is going to like, have an interest in hot springs. This is some of the earliest uh, Department of Interior sort of landscape development and landscape design that we have in US history. Uh, we had already had the first military protection of the natural resources. Uh, eight years before they get to Yellowstone. So we're at the beginning, the forefront of, you know, what is the what is the park and what is the federal role, government's role in protecting parks? So we covered up Hot Springs Creek. We built a really cool bandstand. If anybody wants to, if you see anybody at this bandstand playing music under a bandstand today, something has gone wrong, that bandstand no longer exists and you are living in a the multiverse for the moment. Uh, but we have Bathhouse Road that is at least superficially uh, supervised, managed by the National Park Service, though the buildings are all privately owned. And we also have the, the mud hole or the government-free bathhouse, right? So there's 
management happening in hot springs beginning in the 1870s, but really in the 1880s, especially into the 1890s, that is sort of what is a park and how do what are we supposed to do with this space? And so I and I want to reiterate that the government free bathhouse uh, seen here in one of its earlier earliest um, presentations, but then later in its uh, 19 early 1900s form is really this this promise that anyone can come to hot springs right if you are ailing if you are the wealthiest of the wealthy but also the poorest of the poor this is a federally subsidized bathhouse for your needs to meet the the public health desires of all the population right this is a really profound aspect of early public health management in the united states we also have Drum roll, please. Yes, um, the Army Navy Hospital, seen here in its sort of Victorian era form. This building is going to be torn down. The new one erected in the 1930s, but you can see this beautiful Victoria. Uh, yeah, more or less. I'm not an architect, but uh, this sort of late 1800s uh, architectural style. But it's showing that not only are people coming for health and pleasure, not only is it for all classes, but it is also for soldiers in the U.S. military, right? So this is literally sort of naming Hot Springs as the health destination that has been sort of decreed by the federal government. You know, America's Spa, we have uh, by the 1880s, there's no more creek to be seen, but you have Bathhouse Row, you have the Government Free Bathhouse, you have the Army Navy Hospital, you have vapor rising, at least theoretically in this picture. Most of the springs have been covered over by that time, but we'll pretend. And so you have Hot Springs as this health and leisure resort, most of its resources being overseen and provided by either the federal government or people with leases from the federal government. Not only that, we, this is familiar to a lot of us, but Hot Springs is also serving as a model for other parks. Uh, this is a really lame slide. I should never just put uh, print to paper, but I wasn't able to make the slide any better. But Hot Springs Reservation becomes a park that is, is repeated and talked about across the globe. Not only the Saratoga Spa State Park in New York, uh, sort of try to redefine itself on the hot springs reservation, sort of public water for public use and public health. But so does Platt National Park in Oklahoma, again today part of the Chickasaw National Recreation Area. And believe it or not, has anybody been to Canada? Did you go to this national park? The very first place that the Canadian government went to to understand management of BAMP was Hot Springs Reservation. They came down here and like, how are they doing? How are they leasing the water? What is the public health impact? And so Hot Springs, so Banff National Park was originally Banff Hot Springs Reservation. We see it parallels with Hot Springs. And uh, by the 19 teens, there's even looking, the people are looking at Thermopolis, Wyoming, if you've ever been there. That's uh, really nice, it's all the way back to Yellowstone. And uh, it doesn't become a state park at that time on the Hot Springs model. It will later on on uh, the Saratoga model, which is the Hot Springs model. So A plus B equals C. We are sort of a, a progenitor of this vision of parks, not as necessarily scenic places, but as uh, public health mineral spring reservations. Just to give a, a view of these spots, we have Platt. We have Saratoga Springs with the New York State Reservation. We have Thermopolis and Banff. And so these are places that are built on the hot springs model, or at least imagined as the hot springs model. And yet, um, as they might say today, people be hating a little bit on hot springs because you, you're going to see from those early park advocates that. Even though Hot Springs uh, has been around for 80 years, even though it's a, a model across the country um, and across the, the world, it just there's something about it that it doesn't feel like those scenic pleasuring grounds like Yosemite, like Yellowstone. And so you'll see even from leading uh, proponents of the National Park Service that it 
never somehow never seemed like a national park. Morris, we let you bathe at the Fordyce. What are you trying to say about this? Um, even in the national parks conferences where they're trying to define uh, sort of in the lead up to the Organic Act, the secretary just like says this offhand in some of the meeting notes you know, that we segregate hot springs from the other national parks. And uh, in 1922, as they're sort of developing sort of histories of the national parks, the historian here says that it was, it's not a, it's not a national park, but it's not a pleasure ground, it's more like a resort, right? So they're trying to define national parks. They're actually trying to define national parks almost against Hot Springs. So Hot Springs is sort of the antithesis park for a lot of the proponents of, of scenic wonders. Uh, but we're, you know, it's, Fascinating to see that there was some, it was the same thing that happens today with our historians for the Park Service where they give us a, like a glancing blow and then they go on to something else that's actually happening for a lot of scenic park proponents in the 19, early 1900s. They'll sort of reference Hot Springs for a sentence, maybe two if we're lucky, maybe three if we paid them off to keep on talking about us, and then they'll sort of go on their way to what a national park is outside of Hot Springs. And yet, if we go back to the Organic Act and we think about how it's supposed to balance the conservation of scenery and public use, right? It's supposed to be about preservation of scenery, economic tourism, and efficient management of parks. Hot Springs has a tremendous role, and we are a notable example. And in fact, you could almost see us as the most obvious form of bridging that utilitarian and conservation gap. And I'll show you what that mean, what I mean by that with Hot Springs as sort of the bridge. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised that it's disregarded by people looking for an aesthetic and scenic playground, but it will be repeatedly highlighted uh, for by people who have a more utilitarian mind and who are more political pragmatists. The reason that Hot Springs is going to be highlighted is because the proponents of parks might not want to come here, but everybody else does. So if we look at the visitation to national parks in the decade leading up to the National Park Service, what do we notice about the blue line next to Hot Springs? We have 120 here, it's actually 25,000 at Platt National Park. But Jellystone is at 19,000 visitors. And for the most part, Hot Springs only goes up. And if you were to calculate, you get out your calculator and you were to take the totals and then Hot Springs amount of those totals, we are fully a third of all visitors to the National Park Service, to the future National Park Service. So if you are trying to convince a utilitarian minded uh, senator or representative that there's an economic boost of tourism, you need hot springs because hot springs boosts your numbers like no other place can. That's my drum roll. <laughs> if you want to have an efficiently run park, we have 90, so about 90 employees in the National Park Service, the future park service in 1915. This is the list of those park employees that are specifically at Hot Springs. There are 30 employees. A third of all employees from the National Park Service are here at Hot Springs. This is a managed space. And not only that, but our list of people who have been working here, we have uh, police officers, we have supervisors, we have uh, the gardeners. There are also, there's a huge labor contingent, but there's also a bathhouse attendance at the government free bathhouse. And in fact, we can see with, whether it's uh, Mary Clark or Maddie Fielding, who's actually, Mary, Maddie Fielding has been working there for a decade at this point. The first women to work in the National Park Service, future National Park Service, were probably working in hot springs. The, the next old, the next earliest was a uh, secretary at Platt National Park. But here in Hot Springs, this is from 1915, but uh, there are 1900 same list, and we see the first women to work in a national park 
or here in Hot Springs because of the variety, because of the management practices that are required for a public reservation that is for public health and that has a government subsidized bathhouse. We also have the first integrated workforce in the National Park Service. Uh, there have been uh, integrated workforces at other parts, but they were usually people working with, um, like they were in the army and they were on site. But this is in the National Park Service, uh, specifically employed by the Department of the Interior. And so we can see that efficient management, but also a lot of early stories in uh, the Park Service management overall. And we also got a really cool champion. He's this really rich guy that had gotten uh, a lot of money based on borax mining. And his name is Stephen Mather. And if you've ever been to Pettigene State Park and you went to the lodge and you now they have a new lodge, you can see the view from there. It's named after Stephen Mather, first director of the National Park Service. And he loved hot springs. I cannot emphasize enough. This is him on a horse in Happy Hollow. And he would come here uh, for recreation. He said, we want to build this on the European model, uh, because if you want to have a national park with international recognition and it's accessible, Hot Springs is the place. Uh, he was, um, you have, he, he knew that you have to meet the public appetite for travel and for rest, and that Hot Springs could be compared to European spas, uh, we could convince people not to go across the Atlantic, but come see hot springs every season. Um, it also met accommodations. We have hotels, whereas other parks were really struggling on visitor accommodations. And so those really cool old hotels that you see photos of or that you go visit today, they were being used by Stephen Mather as a point of, hey, look, we can be in charge of these accommodations, or we can at least uh, manage and lease these accommodations. Trust the Park Service to be able to do that. Furthermore, and I don't want to brag, but we were self-sufficient. We were revenue neutral. We actually made all of our money from the water leases. And so if you're looking for efficient management, not only in employment, but in not being uh, sort of taking the revenue away, Hot Springs was revenue neutral. We still have that debate in the National Park Service today. Every July, we will put out um, our economic imprint and we'll say that basically for every dollar of federal spending is about nine dollars of private spending in the surrounding economy right so we still are building off of stephen mather's view of uh, having to show that there's an economic utilitarianism to tourism and that hot springs is one of uh, the two the leading examples of an early park to be able to achieve that and if you have those pragmatic politicians uh, this is in this is a line from the, this is the opening statement of one of the previous secretaries of the interior in the national park service debates and you can see that he is like this is this is his opening paragraph there's no other park mentioned there he talks about the issues with parks but he will talk about oh nope hot springs being the most useful he's using that terminology of usefulness we can conserve this for usefulness. And he's saying, you've been there. This is the park, you Eastern uh, senators, you have been to Hot Springs. So Hot Springs is used as the, the demonstrative example of effective management and utilitarian design that accommodates tourists. And not only that, but people have known that Hot Springs has this government influence, right? We have uh, this really cool image of a guy on horseback taking everybody to the bandstand for a jazz concert. Probably not what's happening. Uh, Army Navy Hospital, again, government free bathhouse, again. And if you were to zoom in on the next photo, this is a health and leisure resort owned and controlled by the federal government. We were very proud to be a federal reserve and you should know that right you should you can trust the federal government to oversee this public health and leisure playground and so hot springs is able to carry that mantle uh, as a federally owned health and leisure site and so we end up by the 19 teens on the eve of the uh of the organic act with two dozen bathhouses a chief medical officer, right, so we can 
oversee public health reform. We have we've taken out at least most of the drummers. We didn't take out all of them. Uh, there's hundreds of you know, over a hundred thousand annual visitors where other parks are getting 20, 15,000. We have we can guarantee because this is a federally operated site that the physicians and the bath attendants have met some sort of standard of care. And this is a public health, re this is a natural resource that's been preserved for your benefit, and we'll talk about uh, health outcomes in that way. And you, know, you can, again, effective management of this resource. And so despite um, sort of not meeting the aesthetic quality for a lot of national parks, Hot Springs proves, it's like a proof of concept. Right, that a national park can be managed and it can be done by the federal government and that that federal government should be a national park site. And so it is not a coincidence, again, that we're sort of missed, not understood by many advocates and very much the central pillar for other sort of more pragmatic advocates in the park service. And so as a native son of Arkansas, it is thrilling to work at Hot Springs, because I, I say that there's three places where you can really tell about the history of the National Park Service. Um, one is Yosemite, because it had that early documentation. One is Yellowstone, because Yellowstone serves at least today as the idea. Um, but Hot Springs was a different vision for the National Park Service, right? If we had parks on the Hot Springs model, we'd have a bunch of mineral springs and free hospitals as much as we have scenery. And so when we, we we can tell the story of the National Park Service in a different way from Hot Springs. And the National Park Service itself preserves the sacred space, spaces and the sacred stories of the United States. So if we want to better understand the places that were set aside by the generations that came before us for our benefit and for the benefit of future generations, Hot Springs is one of the most interesting uh, options that we have to try to see with a new light these sacred spaces that we have preserved uh, for the benefit of mankind. So thank you all for your support of Hot Springs, and thank you for coming out. <laughs> I successfully saved time for at least one question. Thank you. Anybody had one. Yes, sir. Was today the last day that the Ford Ice was open? Or was it yesterday? yesterday. So don't worry, you're not missing it because you're here. <laughs> I've worked at a lot of, I'm sorry, I've named this several times, and so uh, if you've already heard it, I apologize. Most recently, Arlington House in Washington, D.C., at National Arlington Cemetery. Before that, I'll just name some highlights. Yellowstone, uh, Joshua Tree, Great Sand Dunes. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, so some of those, I, I'm allowed to sort of, say that we're older than Yellowstone because I've worked with Yellowstone. Why is there? How difficult is it for your organization right now here in Hot Springs? How difficult is it for y'all to continue to justify the existence of the waters and the park here, you know, the place Hot Springs usually is on the bottom of the list. A lot of times when you'll see some fluffy stuff about national parks. Mm -hmm. But uh, it sounds like the Park Service is aware of these things and what you're saying. So are you having a, do you have a tough time continuing to justify our existence here? Not with the Park Service itself. Uh, there have actually been times when the National Park Service has sent out people to say, is this park meet park standards? Mm -hmm. um, but and we were named a National Park to, we don't. Not necessarily, it's more not within the National Park Service, but visitors have that curiosity because right, you, we've, we've been trained, at least in this generation, for what to expect. You're supposed to drive through the entrance and then go to the edge of the Grand Canyon and be like, that's a national park, right? So you get trained as a society, just like Smokey the Bear trains us, thank you for service, for how to uh, take care of natural spaces. Uh, we get trained in our parkways for how to drive through scenic areas. Uh, so I would just say that um, it's a matter of shifting public perception, uh, but it's the, that shifting in perception is I'm able to say, hey, I do have to con not convince you, but argue the case. And I bet you've never thought about why a different generation might have had a different thought. And then you get into 
parts as generation upon generation. There are parts that are created today that would have never been created in the past, and vice versa. So I think it, uh, we're just, we just get to answer and ask what each generation set aside for us and why. And that's the ongoing practice. Where exactly is the location of the government free bathhouse that you showed? It is more or less where there's a seep that's coming out of the Grand Promenade today. It's basically right there. If you were to get a sledgehammer, don't do this, but if you were to <laughs> and like knock down the um, I should keep on going. I'm recorded. Uh, it's <laughs> just walk straight through the quapaw under the dome and then back up there. So like that picture of the government free bathhouse, the 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 quapaw is like sitting right here. Okay. Like the, the dome of the quapaw is directly above you. And this is the grand promenade behind you. They've just totally altered the landscape, but it's more or less right there where that seep is. Didn't we have a government free bathhouse here in July 50s? Yeah, so from 1878 basically until uh, 1950, Mark can tell me later. Um, so for over 70 years, they have operated in Hot Springs National Park, a government free bathhouse subsidized by the federal government for the benefit of people who could not afford the, uh, the bathhouses on bathhouse well. It's pretty remarkable of a story. It can be read about probably in the record on one of your articles. Well, you were talking about wearing two hats, but what, what are your day-to-day -day responsibilities? My, so as the education coordinator, what we want to be able to do is, I don't know if any of you have young youngins in your family, but we need to tell people about their national parks, right? We need to introduce them to natural spaces or spaces that are, um, they can just imbibe and revive and enliven the soul. And so that's my number one job with, as an education coordinator is to introduce students to the parks and also to meet state standards um, in that process. As a you know, park ranger, park guide, my role is to, answer, to be, basically be a tour guide, uh, be a, a little bit over enthusiastic, maybe a little bit too talkative of a tour guide, but to stand at the information and orientation desk. And then on my uh, my foundational piece, what my supervisor wants me to do is keep on doing the research because hot, national parks are, you know, these spaces for research, um, for exploration of natural, biological, geological, hydrological, uh, cultural resources. We also get over 300 million visitors a year to national parks. And so we have the greatest spaces for inquiry next to the largest uh, sort of potential in education base. But a lot of times, because of the very uh, structures in the, in the National Park Service, we can sometimes, we're going in two different, many different directions. Uh, we just we can't reach across lines. And so I, I get to work a lot with our cultural resource team and our natural resource team uh, and my own research to uh, continue to tell these stories because we have the longest sort of managed history of a national park. We have not at this point 191 years of history just within the park boundaries and obviously uh, for thousands of years before that. And so the stories that are still yet to be told, and we're, we're always trying to invest more and more to keep on building on the research that people have done before, but the research is always there. It's very exciting to sit there and find new things. If anybody's ever been to the archives, you know that feeling. That's what I'm trying to also keep in mind every day. Yes, sir. You were know, we were the first quarter when they did the, the quarter series, and apparently the government recognized this at that time. Yes. All right. Thank you to the U.S. Treasury and Mint. I, I really appreciate knowing that. Um, like I said, I'm not saying we're the oldest national park. I'm saying that the federal government in the 19 teens said it, and then later versions of those same early documents would change our dates at, to different dates. You could do a whole series on them. Sometimes we're 1877, sometimes we're 1880, sometimes we're 1921, depending on how we get below Yellowstone on the list. Got a question from an online viewer. Uh, can Hot Springs coordinate with other national parks in order to provide more context about the early parks? 
Yes, so um, parks are managed uh, sort of separately. That for various managerial reasons, we do have different resources, we have different visitation uh, patterns, but we will often work to the extent that we have the resources with education teams. Uh, we're doing education programs, the curatorial staff, everything is run out of a, you, know, you go to the regional office and then you go to the national office. And so there's always an interest in that coordination, uh, but we also have a lot of stories that are being asked of us to tell and different parts have different priorities and focuses for their stories, but you know, there are attempts, um, you know, there are people who are actively researching uh, early National Park female employees, there are people who are talking about uh, integration and segregation within National Parks, we have a whole series called Civil War to Civil Rights, right, so we have these thematic aspects, and you know, we just had the centennial, and the centennial 19, uh, 2016 would have had that same component. Um, but actually, right now, if we were to coordinate with other parks, it would be about the upcoming eclipse, which will be coming to uh, Springs in next year, 14 months. So, yes, we can talk about early history and the eclipse in April 2024. Other questions? Thoughts, curiosities, questions? Have you ever had to do a presentation? With the loop thing. <laughs> no, I've not had a, a presentation like that. I did. I've had bison come through a presentation, <laughs> and I had a, a fast approaching thunderstorm over a lake, and I had a. It was 36 degrees, so it wasn't 32 degrees, and it was snow rain. And I was like, nobody's showing up to this, but lo and behold, people go to Yellowstone and they don't mind the weather, and so. Um, th but this is up there, right? So this and the snow rain when the people showed up at this day for 10 minutes, they showed up at eight minutes, so that <laughs> two minute window and I gave them the whole presentation and they were bison. <laughs> and they were quiet all morning. Uh, they were up there. You couldn't hear anything going on in the building. And then this started. <laughs> but but they were, so they much actually, for so much for keeping your cell phones on site. Yeah. <laughs> but the drum rolls are very appropriately timed. Yes. There was a very prominent Native American history here for the back of life line. Yes. Was that something that was discussed or prominent in the early years of the National Park? That an awareness or anything? Absolutely. Because the park is the park is being promoted by uh, largely by bathhouse owners and by business league members. And if you're going to sell people on healing waters, the way to do that is to say that, uh, that these waters have been identified and they've been used for centuries, right? And so the Native American presence, and then is just well, it's chock full. I mean, there's a reason why uh, Colonel Fordyce is going to put into his bathhouse a bunch of pottery to show that history. But also, um, if you wanted to hear about Ponce de Leon and the Fountain of Youth, if you wanted to hear about DeSoto, those are all sort of marketing aspects as much as historical aspects to the park uh, to bring in uh, Eastern like Euro-American visitors. I think I'm about to get cut off. Well, of course they got by. Yeah. Oh, quiet. <laughs> Once we're finished, we don't hear a sound. <laughs> we want to find time. Uh, I want to make a quick announcement since you're all history buffs in the room. We are going to have another program tonight at 6 featuring Abraham Lincoln in theory address. That's at 6 p.m. in this room. Uh, you can come in through the auditorium. The main library closes at 6, but Abe Lincoln will be here tonight at 6 talking about slavery and the emancipation. And hopefully the rivers won't be back. So <laughs> 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 oh,